So welcome to the 2015 Dudley and Lecture. Uh, I'm David Hampton, the Dean of the Harvard Divinity School. It's a real pleasure to welcome you this evening and to introduce the Dudley and Lectures to you. So first of all, my thanks go to Professor uh, Ahmed Ragab and his team within the Science, Religion and Culture Project at the Divinity School and to the History of Science Department at FAS uh, with whom uh, my office has collaborated on organizing tonight's event. So thanks to everyone for their work on this um, through these extraordinary days. Um, let me first talk a little bit about the oldest and most distinguished endowed lecturer at Harvard, the Dudleyan Lecture. The lecture was endowed by Paul Dudley in 1750 with the princely sum of 133 pounds, six shillings and eight pence, uh, the magic of compound interest. Uh, he was born in 1675, just goes to show if you give money to these things. Um, he was born in 1675, and after graduating from Harvard in 1690, Paul Dudley studied law at the Temple in London, uh, returned to Boston, became Attorney General, and eventually Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court. He died in 1751. So previous Dudleyan lectures uh, have included uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, Paul Tillich, and more recent speakers include Scott Appleby, and last year a very uh, powerful presentation by Susan Harjo, who gave a lecture on rescuing religion from civilization about the terrible impact of federal policies on Native American cultures and religions. So our distinguished speaker this evening is uh, my one-time colleague, uh, fellow Irishman, friend, uh, Dr. David Livingston, uh, professor of uh, geography and intellectual history uh, from my alma mater, Queen's University in Belfast. Um, and he's a fellow of the British Academy and also a member of the Royal Irish Academy, which is a great way of balancing the ticket in those parts <laughs> of the world. The title of tonight's lecture is Religious Encounters with Evolution, Place, Politics, and Polemics. You'll get a chance to spot the people here. Uh, we will hear much more about our speaker and tonight's topic in a little bit. So tonight my colleague, Professor uh, Ahmed Ragad, the Richard T. Watson Professor of Science and Religion at Harvard Divinity School, will introduce our speaker. Uh, Professor Agab is a physician, historian, and scholar of the medieval and modern Middle East with a medical degree from Cairo University and a doctorate in history and philosophy of science um, from EPHE in Paris. Professor Agab joined the Faculty of Divinity in 2011. Uh, his work includes the history and development of medieval Islamic sciences, uh, the relationship between science and religion in the medieval and modern Middle East, the history of uh, medieval Islamic hospitals, and the intellectual and cultural history of women in the region. His book on anatomy, medicine, and religion in the Ottoman Middle East is an edition of a rare manuscript of anatomy from 18th century Ottoman Egypt. As the head of the Science, Religion, and Culture Project at the Divinity School, he bridges the two fields of science and religion with great skill and creativity. I'm uh, delighted that he's agreed to introduce tonight's speaker, and it's my pleasure to hand over to him. Uh, I mean, thanks so much. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming in this very cold weather. Perhaps one of the greatest achievements that any scholar can aspire to is to be able to change the way his or her students, colleagues, and other scholar in the field think. It seems much easier to introduce new facts, to shed light on new nuances in particular fields or issues, but it is really the hardest task to change how we think about things. It is the hardest task of all to change how people view their world, how they ask their questions, and how they understand their fields. This scholar's work becomes a light that gives color to a particular scene. It becomes the wisdom that gives meaning to specific utterances, and it gives us this precious aha moment that allows us to understand something that we were not able to see before. In a way, this scholar resembles these giants that our medieval scholars like Bernard Duchart talked about in 1124. These giants on their shoulder we stand, and we may be able to see deeper and further away, but it is because their work, of their work that we're able to see the world in a different light. It is my honor to present to you one of these field-shifting scholars and one of these giants, Professor David Livingstone. <laughs> 
David Livingston is Professor of Geography and Intellectual History at Queen's University in Belfast and elected Fellow of the British Academy since 1995 and also a Fellow of the, Irish, of the Royal Irish Academy. In his words, he explains that his research interests congregate around several related themes, the histories of geographical knowledge, the speciality of scientific culture, and the historical geographies of science and religion. The brilliance of David Livingston's work is not only in his ability to casually enumerate these fields as research interests, in each of which he produced field-changing volumes, but precisely in linking and connecting all these fields in novel and exciting ways. In his book, Putting Science in Its Place, which is a cleverly titled, as many of his other works, Livingston questions the presumption that scientific knowledge is universal and independent of place. Putting science in its place opens up the broad and complex question of what it would mean to think of science as knowledge which is not universal but is particular, that is different when it's done in different cultural contexts, that has a significant portion of its life and character and its movement from one space and one place to another. The emphasis on the particularity of scientific knowledge, on how it should be understood through its place in both the literal and symbolic senses, has tremendous implications not only for history of science. It is precisely the universality of science that underwrote much of the colonial projects. And it is the questioning of this universality of science that brings precisely new lights to these endeavors. His co-edited volume, Geographies of Science, in 2010, elaborates on the geographic turn in the history of science, a turn that Livingston himself contributed to starting in his historical geography of science in 1995. The geographic turn in history of science allowed for scholarly examination of what science is, turning our attention to the movements and the actual embodiments of science. The language of consumption, production, and circulation, which is now so common in science studies, owes much to this particular turn. And of course, he has contributed to the historical consideration of the relationship between science and religion, particularly in relation to Darwinian evolutionary narratives. The most prominent example of this work is Adam's Ancestors, where Livingston traces notions of non-Adamic humanity from the Middle Ages to the present, and uses this as a frame to think through how the biblical narratives have related to ideas of race. In this investigation, Livingston not only changes what we know about the history of evolution and the responses, the religious responses to it, but also how we should think about it. But I cannot conclude my introduction without recognizing David Livingston's many honors and many publications that I would not be able to discuss. He is, again, as I mentioned, Fellow of the British Academy, member of the Royal Irish Academy, Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, member of the Academia Europea, member of the Academy of Social Sciences, member of the International Society of Science and Religion. He was awarded many prizes and distinctions, including Back Award from the Royal Geographic Society in 1997, the Centenary Medal from the Royal Scottish Geographical Society in 1998, the Timbleton Foundation Lecture Prize in 1999, the Founders Medal of the Royal Geographic Society in 2011. In addition to the works that I talked about, he produced many other volumes. Some of these most influential volumes include The Geographical Tradition, Episodes in the History of a Contested Enterprise in 1992, Science, Space, and Hermeneutics in 2002, Geographies of 19th Century Science in 2011, and Dealing with Darwin, Place, Politics, and Rhetoric in Religious Engagements with the Evolution in 2014. I can go on for a while, but I think you're not here to listen to me. So please join me in welcoming Professor David Livingston. Yeah, well, thank you <laughs> for that introduction, and um, it's a wonderful pleasure and privilege to be here. I'm, I'm delighted to have the chance to be back in Harvard and to be talking tonight about one of my enthusiasms, which is the topic about 
about science and religion. And nice to see uh, John showing up, who has disagreed with me on many of these topics for years. So I'm really looking forward to, to what he's going to have to say later on. But, but thank you uh, to Ahmed and um, others in the uh, Science Studies and Divinity School for organizing this, and my old friend David Hempton for also being involved with this invitation. Um, so uh, my topic tonight, um, uh, religious encounters with evolution, uh, place politics and poetics. I'm, I'm going to deal with this pretty much in a historical way. Um, but I hope that as I do this, you'll be thinking that it might also tell us something about the present uh, situation we find ourselves in with respect to debates and discussions over issues to do with religious faith and, um, and scientific uh, theories. So um, let me begin. Um, and a lot of this will be story, if I can put it this way, uh, narratives. It's October 1874. Robert Rainey has just been appointed the new principal of the Free Church of Scotland's College in Edinburgh. And he's delivering the opening lecture of that academic year, 1874. To the enthusiastic applause of his hearers, he, announce, he announces, the application of theories of evolution to the origin of man is a point regarding which the theologian may be perfectly at ease. Now, just a few miles away, across the Irish Sea, Josiah Porter, professor of biblical criticism at the Sister College, except not in Edinburgh this time, but in my own city of Belfast, he is likewise inaugurating the new term. But his tone is markedly different. In this introductory lecture, Porter speaks ominously of how the evil tendencies of recent scientific theories threaten to question every virtuous thought, to repress every noble aspiration. Now, that very same year, still 1874, on your side of the Atlantic, this side of the Atlantic, Charles Hodge, the doyen of the Princeton theologians, concludes his analysis of the question that was posed in the title of his final book, What is Darwinism? His answer was, what is Darwinism? Darwinism is atheism. A decade later, James Woodrow gives voice to his support for evolution in a lecture that he gave to the Alumni Association of the Columbia Seminary in the Southern Presbyterian Church. He had this to say, if the theory of descent with modification is true, it should be expected that in the regions recently separated, the animals would differ but slightly. In regions separated long ago, the animals would differ more widely. This is exactly what we find. Now, these four figures all belong to one self-identifying confessional family, Scots Presbyterianism. Wherever they were located, they all exhibited an enthusiasm for their Calvinist heritage, and they shared a very seriously similar theological architecture. What's noticeable is that they responded in remarkably different ways to Charles Darwin's theory. The question is simple, why? And that's what I want to answer, try to answer for you tonight. But I want to do a little bit of background thinking about um, some of the ideas that I will want to put to operation in this, in this talk tonight. So I'll, I'll depart from that story just, just for a minute. Theories travel, thoughts travel. They journey around the world. But as theories journey around the world, they don't move effortlessly from place to place. In different places, in different venues, they mean and they are made to mean different things. This is because the, the circulation of ideas is not simply about transferring ideas. It's about transforming them. It's not just about dissemination. It's about appropriation. Uh, the literary theorist Edward Said called attention to this very phenomenon. His point was simple, but I think profound. The movement of any new theory 
into a new space, he says, necessarily involves processes of representation different from that at the point of origin. And this complicates any account of the transplantation, transference, circulation, and commerce of theories and ideas. As thoughts move, they change. Now, now Charles Darwin's theory has moved around the world, and different communities have had very different dealings with it. Uh, my quarry tonight is to track down something of what Darwin's theory was seen to signify in a number of different settings in the, in the decades around 1900, particularly amongst groups sharing the same confessional heritage. Now, what animates my mission is the conviction that there's value in attending to what I'm going to call the geographies of reading and speech spaces, I'll explain those, in making sense of how different communities engaged with Darwin. Uh, by the first of these terms, the, the geographies of reading, I mean the different ways that texts are read in different venues and how they are marshaled or mobilized in particular places for particular projects. By speech spaces, I refer to how, in different venues, the way in which those venues condition what can be said about new knowledge claims, but also what can't be said in certain places. Uh, these places condition how things are said and how they are heard. Uh, this is for the simple reason that location and locution are intimately interconnected. So, it's about texts, and it's about talk. Uh, James Secord's analysis of the different ways that an anonymous book called The Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, the different ways that this was read in different settings, illustrates something of what I mean by the spaces or the geographies of reading. This book was, was um, published in the 1830s anonymously. It was embraced by some it was vilified by others. Some were bemused by it. Others were infuriated. Others were consoled. Some were revolted in the way it portrayed the drama of, of evolution. One thought it a priceless treasure. Another dismissed it as nothing but materialist pegology. Some found it manly. Others were sure that they could detect a womanly hand behind its anonymity. Besides, this anonymity generated a distinct geography of authorial speculation. As readers wrestled over how to fix this ethereal author, it mattered whether the author was thought to be from the gentry or from the working class, whether the author was a believer or an infidel, whether the author was a gentleman or woman or a cad. Speculative names that circulated in Edinburgh never surfaced in Oxford, while those that, according to Jim, were common in London's fashionable West End were barely known in the St. Giles rookeries only a few blocks away. I think what this serves to do is to, is to highlight the instability of textual meaning and to remind us that while texts might be immutable mobiles, as Latour would have it, their meanings are entirely mutable. That's because the coming together of a text and a reader is a moment of creativity in which, a, in which meaning is made and remade. So we mustn't think of the encounter with a text as simply the receiving of an idea, the passive consumption of it. No, it's much more a dialogue, a situated dialogue between text and reader. So much for reading. But no less important, I think, in intellectual commerce is another fundamental element in human communication. Talk. Talk. Unlike textual encounter, talk is transformative. Uh, um, in a stimulating set of lectures on, on BBC Radio given some years ago on the art of conversation by Theodore Zeldin, Zeldin has this to say, when minds meet, they don't just exchange facts, they transform them reshape them 
draw different implications from them, engage in new trends of thought. Conversation doesn't just reshuffle the cards. It creates new cards. What's important here is that talk isn't simply about transferring ideas. It's about transformation. Now, of course, conversations take place in very different arenas. And they're governed by very different kinds of conventions. Each of these arenas constitute what I would like to call speech spaces, where place and protocol combine to shape how the conversation takes place. Now, I think this has far-reaching implications. Speech spaces shape what can be said and what can't be said in particular venues. How they're heard, how things are said. This is because there are different protocols for managing speech in different places. In some places, something that's trendy will be taboo somewhere else. In public spaces and in camera, in conferences and consultations, in courtrooms and clinics, in all these venues, different things are speakable and unspeakable. Now, it's not too difficult to see how crucial these are in thinking about matters of religion and science. They impinge on matters to do with rhetoric, audience, tone, reputation, and the like. Let, let me give you an example. Uh, take what I would call family space, talking at home. A sensitivity about what a person could say at home was something that leading naturalists reflected on from time to time in the 19th century. The botanist Joseph Dalton Hooker, for example, spelled out the dilemma in a letter he sent to Charles Darwin in 1865. And here he was concerned about the social pressures about conforming to family expectations. It's all very well for Wallace to ponder at scientific men being afraid of saying what they think. Had he as many kind and good relations as I have, who would be grieved and pained to hear me say what I think? And had he children who would be placed in predicaments most detrimental to children's minds, he would not wonder so much. Now, concerns like these easily spilled over into anxieties about what a person was comfortable saying in a public arena. In institutional settings, how the new science of evolution was talked about required special care. And the consequences of violating expectations could have far-reaching results. The American geologist Alexander Winchell discovered this to his bitter cost. As he mused in an explanatory letter to the readers of the Nashville American in 1878, I've always taken pains in my lectures at Nashville to avoid the utterance of opinions which I supposed were disapproved of by the officers of the university. That should please every dean's heart, <laughs> I think. Unfortunately, um, Alexander Winchell failed in his tongue tactics. He was fired from Vanderbilt University over issues to do with the theory of evolution and the human races. Well, I've given you enough by way of sort of background and so on. It's now time for me to try and put Darwinism in its place. Now, if my reflections on reading texts differently in different places and talking about theories differently in different places, I mean, if that's even in the right neighborhood, surely there are significant implications for understanding how Darwin was read and how Darwin was talked about in different places. Let me just give you a thumbnail sketch of one or two sites to illustrate before we even get to the matter of evolution and religion. Consider first the Charleston Museum of Natural History in South Carolina during the years immediately following the appearance of Darwin's Origin of Species. Now, among the naturalists who congregated there was the marine invertebrate naturalist John McCrady. McCrady was a lifelong opponent of Darwin's theory. Why? To answer that question takes us to the very core of John McCrady, McCrady's politics. McCrady was always concerned to keep nature and culture in conceptual tandem. And so he readily took to mobilizing his scientific work in the interests of an independent South, 
using geological metaphors to naturalize what he hoped would be the geopolitical dis disruption of the Union. The separation of this Union will be a convulsion, he hoped, announcing in 1861. But like those vast convulsions of geological times, it'll be a convulsion of development, a grand and majestic step in advance. Now you see here, for, for McCrady, his politics and, and his conceptions of natural history were at one. For, he insisted, if this be the course of our development, then is it in perfect harmony with all other great developments in nature. When he read Darwin, however, he found something very, very different. Darwin's theories about human origins and about the capacity of one species to transmute into another was deeply, they, these were deeply troubling for John McCrady. Why? McCrady was dedicated to the idea of racial superiority, and he closely followed his teacher Louis Agassiz in insisting that the different human races constituted different human species. To McCrady, Darwin's theory of common origins and of the capacity of species to transmute was nothing less than a subversive threat to the entire nature of Southern racial culture. That was the meaning that McCrady discerned in The Origin of Species. That's what he saw when he read the text. His reading of Darwin was shaped by the cultural politics of his interpretive community at the Charleston Museum. There, a group of naturalists cultivated a distinctly southern style of science. And nowhere was this more clearly manifest than in their efforts to seek in natural history justification for their ideas about social hierarchy. Edmund Ravenel, for example, declared that the laws of nature could never be obliterated by abolitionists. This was the textual space into which Darwin's work was cast. And the meanings that were attributed to Darwin's theory were shaped by what was taken to be Darwin's implications for race politics, postbellum anxieties about the fragmentation of the South, and anxieties over the liberalizing politics of Reconstruction. Now let me take you half a world away to another site New Zealand, a very different place and a very different polemics. In New Zealand society in general, unlike in the American South, Darwinian evolution was welcomed. Why? Because it was seen to endorse the runaway triumphs of white colonial settlement. A set of public lectures presented at the Colonial Museum introduced he um, hearers to Darwin's theory in 1868. The speaker was the New Zealand politician William Travers, wouldn't you know it, an Irishman from Limerick, a botanist, a lawyer, and a correspondent of Darwin. Now, in The Origin of Species, as he read it, he found a theory that had immediate implications for colonial history. Just as the European rat, goat, and honeybee and other invader species had displaced their New Zealand counterparts, so, he writes, the vigorous races of Europe are wiping out the Maori. It was an iron law of nature. In the struggle for existence, Travers insisted, whenever a white race comes into contact with an indigenous dark race on ground suitable to the former, the latter must disappear in a few generations. Now for him, this state of affairs, of course, wasn't to be lamented. To the contrary, it was to be embraced. So whatever the temporary moral disquiet that attended the prospect of an entire culture's annihilation, Travers was sure that the historic successes of European culture meant that even the most sensitive philanthropist may learn to look with resignation, if not with complacency, on the extinction of a people which in the past had, had accomplished so imperfectly every object of man's being. Travers's encounter with Darwin's theory and the meanings that he found in it were molded by the local contingencies of settler Maori politics and his desire to enlist the most enlightened science of his day 
in the service of domestic colonial policy. Travers wasn't alone. Other members of the, of the Wellington Scientific Fraternity took the same line. Walter Buller, for example, a fellow of the Royal Society and a magistrate as well as ornithologist, used his presidential address to the Wellington Philosophical Society to say that the Aboriginal peoples must recede in the face of civilization. Here's what he says, and this is actually almost a quote from Darwin's Descent of Man. <clears throat> Just as the Norwegian had destroyed the native rat, so surely would the Maori disappear before the Pakia, the settlers. It was simply one of those inscrutable laws of nature. In this context, the idea of struggle as an irresistible primal force became the hermeneutic key to delivering a Darwinian apologia for white settler politics. Adopted for racial reasons, in New Zealand, and rejected for racial reasons in the American South. Now, the very principle that made Darwin's theory attractive to New Zealand audiences, struggle, was exactly what perturbed the circle that gathered at the St. Petersburg Society of Naturalists in late 19th century Russia. Of central importance here were the interventions of a zoologist called Karl Kessler, in 1879, he scrutinized Darwin's theory in, a, in an essay tellingly entitled The Law of Mutual Aid. Drawing on his research on uh, fish in the uh, Aralo-Caspian region, he condemned, and I quote, the cruel so-called law of the struggle for existence. The Darwinians, he believed, continually ignored the law of mutual aid, which he said, is, if anything, more important than the law of the struggle for existence. He reported on the way in which he had found cooperation among species um, and reciprocated care to actually have improved the survival chances of bees and spiders and reptiles and a host of other, of other creatures. Now, Kessler's way of reading Darwin didn't remain an isolated textual event. It actually inaugurated an entire reading history that steered the St. Peter's, Petersburg engagement with evolutionary theory for generations, most notably in the writings of the anarchist Prince Peter Kropotkin. Like his associates, Kropotkin advocated Darwinism with its Malthusian teeth extracted. Reflecting on his zoological inquiries with Polyakov in Siberia, he recalled, we witnessed numbers of facts of mutual support. The same impression appears in the works of most Russian zoologists, and it probably explains why Kessler's ideas were so welcomed by the Russian Darwinists, why like ideas are not in vogue amidst the followers of Darwin in, in, in Western Europe. Kropotkin put his finger on the nub of the issue in a letter that he wrote to, wrote to Mary Goldsmith where he noted, figures like Kessler, Sivertsov, Mensebeer, and Brandt, and he says, finally myself, stand against the Darwinist exaggeration of struggle within a species. We see a great deal of mutual aid where Darwin and Wallace see only struggle. Now, it's pretty clear to me that place and politics and polemics played a central role in how scientists engaged with Darwin's theory. If I can use scientist in the modern sense, I probably really shouldn't. But nonetheless, it strikes me that if it were true for these natural history engagements with Darwin, the self-same conditions might just have etched themselves as deeply into religious encounters with Darwin's theory at the time. Now, keeping a clear eye on local circumstances, I want to argue, opens up entirely new dimensions to the subject of religious encounters with evolution, one that is typically buried beneath a veneer of presumption and stereotype. And I simply want to tell you a few stories about the individuals with which I began and their encounters with Darwin in different places. Edinburgh, evolution, and we'll get to the fun bit, mimetic cannibalism, in a minute or two. I hope that'll be enough to keep you all with me. <laughs> 
we'll see. At the opening of the 1874 academic year, Robert Rainey, I mentioned him at the beginning, recently appointed as principal of the new college, uh, Presbyterian College, Free Church College in Edinburgh, decided that the subject for his inaugural address as he opened his principalship was evolution and theology. Here he announced, evolution is continually going on before our eyes. I should not regard the question whether man's animal constitution could conceivably be developed from lower forms as one of any great theological interest. He just felt it was irrelevant to theology. Now, to much of the secular press, the ability of the new college principal to fudge issues earned him the title of Dr. Misty as well as Dr. Rainey. And to be sure, Rainey's forte was ecclesiastical politics. But what's significant is he wasn't too misty on this issue. He was so sensitive to his denominational constituency that the very fact that he could endorse evolution at New College in 1874 is indicative of a general lack of panic about Darwin among Scots Presbyterians as the final quarter of the 19th century dawned. That hadn't always been the case, of course. When Thomas Henry Huxley visited Edinburgh's working classes in 1862 to talk about Darwinism, I tell you, that had the free church venting its spleen. Before a packed audience, Huxley attacked the biblical account of creation and declared that humans were descended from the same stock as apes. That really did throw the free church in the 1860s into a right spasm. Huxley, for his part, was, of course, mightily pleased. He reveled in what he, in what he called the, and I quote him, large and liberal cursing that he'd received from the free church coterie. He wasn't phased by that at all. In fact, in a letter to Dystery, he had this to say. Here's Huxley. Life has its joys, my son, if we can earn them. I believe he did that in, in Edinburgh. But now, later in the century, as it wore on, more and more serious theological voices were added in support of evolution in, in Edinburgh. Robert Flint, the Reverend Robert Flint, who took up a professorship in Edinburgh, worked hard to develop an evolutionary natural theology. He urged that the law of heredity, the tendency to definite variation, and the law of natural selection could all be read as expressions of how God created this world. Or take again the case of the United Presbyterian clergyman Henry Calderwood, a supporter of the evangelistic activities of Moody and an enthusiast for Scott's common sense, he took up the chair of moral philosophy in Edinburgh in 1868. He welcomed evolution as a bona fide scientific theory. And in his book, Evolution and Man's Place in Nature, he declared, evolution stands before us as an impressive reality in the history of nature. Now, this accommodation to Darwin is quite marked, I think. But in order to understand that accommodation in the local circumstances of Edinburgh in the 1870s and 80s, we have to set it alongside other matters that were really testing the patience of Scots Presbyterian culture at the time. For during the 1870s and 80s, Darwinism paled into complete insignificance besides something else that was bothersome, a protracted heresy trial of William Robertson Smith a theologian, which made headline news. Now, things had come to a head in 1876 when lit litigation began. It would end in Smith's dismissal from his chair at the Free Church College in Aberdeen. What sparked off the row was Smith's entries for the ninth edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. It revealed his acceptance of German biblical criticism. Later, he would produce an immensely influential historical anthropology entitled the religion of the Semites. Here, in this work, he urged that a primitive sense of communal unity had found in early humans, uh, amongst the early Israelites, um, it found expression in a ceremonial meal, which really was the precursor of Christian Eucharist. But this was a meal with a difference. The items on the, on the menu were provided through ritual cannibalism. Revitalization of the tribe's sense of belonging was secured, as George Davy pungently expresses it, through, and I quote Davy, eating the gobbets of throbbing flesh newly killed of their fellow tribesmen. Wow. <laughs> 
In his novel application of totem worship to the Hebrew Bible, Smith drew on the researches of his old friend J.F. McLennan, who in primitive marriage, that's William Robertson Smith, religion on the rise of the Semites, and now we have McLennan. McLennan had argued for the matriarchal and polyandric origins of civilization, both of which were rooted in the unintended consequences of female infanticide. Smith applied this theory to the Old Testament, and that shocked the Free Church to its core. Plainly, there was more than enough sex and violence among Scots Presbyterians to satisfy even Freud. Actually, there were too much for Freud, because Freud acknowledged his own profound indebtedness to Robertson Smith, but said that he found cannibalistic nostalgia just a bit too much. <laughs> Those guys got real. In these circumstances, if the orthodox mind was to take up arms, it wasn't against Darwin. It was about biblical criticism, conjectural prehistory, and speculative anthropology. These were the arenas in which engagement was required. They were far more threatening than the idea of one species changing into another. No matter what Dan Dennett says, Darwin's idea was not a dangerous idea as far as they were concerned. Let me move now across the Irish Sea to Belfast, Tyndall, and science in a sectarian society. Now, that very same winter, 1874, when Rainey is opening his arms to evolutionary possibilities at the Free Church College across the Irish Sea, J.L. Porter, whom I mentioned at the beginning, delivered his opening address. He stood, and I quote him, prepared to show that not a single scientific fact has ever been established, he told his readers, from which the deadly dogmas of the evolutionists could be deduced. Sister churches, very different judgment. As Porter's evaluations suggest, Darwin's fate among Belfast Presbyterians was dramatically different from his reception or the way he was read or talked about by their Edinburgh counterparts. Why? On Wednesday, the 19th of August, 1874, the local newspaper enthusiastically announced the coming of the Parliament of Science, the British Association affectionately known as the British Ass, came to Belfast. The meeting was being welcomed to the city as a temporary respite from, from David, can you believe this, spinning and weaving and orange riots and ecclesiastical squabbles. <laughs> Nevertheless, some hot discussions were predicted in the biological section. The Belfast meeting was to be a jamboree. Huxley, Hooker, Lubbock, and Tyndall were all speechifying. Now, if indeed an assault was to be mounted by this new scientific priesthood on the old clerical guardians of revelation and respectability, could there be a better place for a call to arms than Calvinist Belfast? That year, the president was the pugnacious Irish physicist John Tyndall. His truculent performance didn't fall short of expectations. He announced, all religious theories schemes and systems must submit to the control of science and relinquish all thought of controlling it. Tyndall had thrown down a gauntlet to those present. So began what I call Belfast's winter of discontent. Events moved quickly. The next Sunday, Tyndall's presidential address was the subject of a fractious attack by Robert Watts, the professor of systematic theology. Watts was in a bad mood. He was already spitting blood for this reason. He'd offered a paper to the British ass, congenially entitled Peace and Cooperation Between Science and Theology. They flatly turned it down. He was annoyed, but now Tyndall's mention of Epicurus galled him even more. Watts balked at the moral implications of adopting Epicurean values. That was a system, he said, that had wrought the ruin of the communities and individuals who have acted out as principles in the past. And if the people of Belfast practice its degrading dogmas, the moral desti destiny of the metropolis of Ulster may easily be forecast. Now, the full details of this address appeared the next week in the newspaper. And a pamphlet sold 5,000 copies within a month 
probably better than most of my books, I have to confess. <laughs> At the next meeting of the Belfast Presbytery, one of the ministers, William Johnson, recalled how, through its presidential address and its bigoted rejection of Professor Watts's peace offering, the British Association had made itself, and I quote him, a party to a one-sided attack on Christianity. Johnson was determined not to let the matter lie dormant in the minute book, and so he met with several clergy to lay plans for a course of winter lectures on science and religion in the local downtown church that winter. Soon, they'd be gathered together into a book distributed on both sides of the Atlantic, um, dealing with science and revelation. During this winter series, eight theologians and one scientist, David Moore of the Glasnevin Botanical Gardens, took part. They were all, in one way or another, attacking Tyndall's speech. William Todd Martin, to just give one example, was deeply troubled by the social implications of evolutionary materialism. He believed that a Darwinian society would anesthetize conscience, consign morality to a mere survival strategy, and indeed open the door to all sorts of scary eugenic experiments. This winter series was nothing less than a concerted effort to set the terms in which the conversation about evolution had to be conducted in Belfast. And the polemics made it almost impossible for mediating voices to be heard. But more, just over a year before the British Association turned up in Belfast, the Catholic serial, the Irish Ecclesiastical Record, had also castigated Darwinism, particularly for its distasteful moral implications. As for the latest clash in Belfast, the Catholic hierarchy issued a pastoral letter that very November in which they repudiated the blasphemy upon this Catholic nation that has recently been uttered by the professors of materialism under the name of science. To give up ecclesiastical control of education, the Catholic Church said in these circumstances, would be nothing but blind folly. It reinforced them in their desire to not adopt the new university system that was being established in Ireland at the time. Now, in many ways, there's a close similarity between what the Catholic attack on Darwinian materialism looked like and the Presbyterian one. But this is Ireland. This is Ireland. Robert Watts didn't go in for cultivating ecumenical relations. In fact, he worked hard to say that his opposition to Darwin was much different from the Catholic one, and thus to cast Darwinism and Catholicism as twin allies against real science and the revealed truths of Scripture. It actually became possible for him to conflate as a single object of reproach an old enemy, popery, and a new, a new enemy, evolution. Of course, by now, Watts is growing disillusioned with the way in which his Edinburgh colleagues are responding to evolution. As he put it in a letter to a correspondent at Princeton in the United States, he wrote, I dread the influence of the Scotch theological halls. He had in mind Robertson Smith, Rainey, and also figures like Marcus Dodds. He found their scholarship outrageous. Marcus Dodds, for his part, was quite appalled at Watts and quipped that Mr. Watts is one of those unhappily constituted men who cannot write unless they are angry. Let me move across the Atlantic. Columbia, science and the culture of the lost cause. Woodrow Wilson's uncle, James Woodrow, whom I mentioned in the first, uh, first few minutes of this talk, was fired from his post in 1886 from the Southern Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Columbia, where he had occupied the Perkins Professorship of Natural Science in connection with revealed religion. Woodrow's undoing was an account of his conviction that Darwin's theory provided a pretty good account of the development of life. Now, on the face of it, Woodrow's removal centered on matters of biblical interpretation. And that no doubt explains why again and again he, he declared that he accepted the full inspiration of the Bible. The keeper of the Southern Presbyterian sacred flame, Robert Dabney, however, had suspicions about this Perkins chair right from the start, and he wasn't at all persuaded about what Woodrow was doing. 
To him, it was just impossible to believe both in Scripture and in evolution. John Girardot, currently a professor at the seminary and another leader in the opposition to Woodrow, thought the whole business boiled down to a contest between Dr. Woodrow's hypothesis and the Bible, and this is interesting, as our church interprets it, between this scientific view and our Bible, the Bible as it is to us. George Armstrong, a clergyman and former professor of chemistry and architect of the resolution that actually removed Woodrow from his post, totally agreed. We say these teachings of evolution are dangerous errors because they endanger the plenary inspiration of the scriptures. Doctrinal though these debates and theological seem to be, in fact, in my view, something else was much more critically important, the politics of race. Antebellum Southern Presbyterians had long regarded the Bible as the foundation stone of Southern culture. To them, it was a plain, literal reading of the text that provided ample justification for slavery. And they saw abolitionism as a rationalistic assault on the integrity of Scripture and the Christian character of the Old South. Thus, they appealed to the Bible as a means of resisting a host of Yankee evils, radical democracy, emancipation, higher criticism, and modern science. Woodrow's chief critic, Dabney, was already well known for his opposition to public education on account of its trend towards social leveling and for his belief that abolition, abolitionism was the product of atheistic theories of human rights. In an 1876 examination of racial mixing in the common school system, he declared, the satanic artificers of our subjugation well knew the work which they designed to perpetuate. It's to so mingle that blood which flowed in the veins of our Washingtons, Lees, and Jackson, and which, the consecra and which consecrated the battlefields of the, of the Confederacy to mix it with this sordid alien taint. To Dabney, slavery was plainly taught in Scripture. Abolitionist attacks were simply attacks on the unadulterated Word of God, literally understood. So he was constitutionally allergic to any theories, particularly evolutionary ones, that played metaphorical with plain Scripture. It was the same for the veteran pro-slavery polemicist Armstrong, who was also an opponent of Woodrow and author of The Christian Doctrine of Slavery. They shared the same conviction and told, he did, his readers that abolitionism had sprouted from infidel philosophy. In these circumstances, any attempt to read Genesis in poetic voice to accommodate any aspect of Darwin was widely denounced. A literalist biblical hermeneutic was the foundation stone of their culture, and they weren't going to let that crumble to accommodate the speculations of some fanciful theory about one species transmuting into another. And my final case, Princeton, Darwin, and the shorthorn cattle. Pondering on a student days at Princeton College in the 1860s, Benjamin Warfield, perhaps the most accomplished of the old school theologians, reflected on his time as a student. I was already a Darwinian, of the purest water. Now, on the face of it, this seems really curious. In the light of Warfield's forceful defense of biblical inerrancy and his opposition to liberalism in his own denomination. How could this be? I think Warfield is well known for his, uh, for his development of a, of a doctrine of biblical inerrancy and indeed for opposition to liberalism. What's less well known is that in 1873, just before he became a seminary student, he served as, yes, livestock editor for the Farmer's Home, Home Journal of Lexington, Kentucky. Strange choice, no, I don't think so. He was remarkably well fitted for the job. As a college student, he'd studied scientific subjects, and his brother recalled how, quotes, he read Darwin's newly published works with enthusiasm. But even more, he came from a prominent livestock breeding family in Kentucky. 
His father, William Warfield, was a prominent shorthorn cattle breeder and acquired a substantial reputation for his own work on the theory and practice of cattle breeding. In its preface, William paid tribute to the assistance of his son, Benjamin, and happily added that his pursuit of the more weighty things of theology had done nothing to destroy his capacity for taking an occasional part in the active discussion of cattle matters. There you go. Now, judging by the cattle breeding book, the Warfields were very well acquainted with the writings of Charles Darwin. That's not surprising, is it? Matters of variation, heredity, reversion to type, and such like, occupied the thoughts of animal breeders, whether breeding cattle or canaries, pigeons or pigs, as much as they aroused the curiosity of Charles Darwin. And indeed, Darwin's thoughts on all sorts of subjects, line breeding, heritable mutations, outcrossing, atavism, variation and the like, they're all laced into the fabric of this particular book. But it wasn't just empirical particulars that William culled from Darwin. Natural selection, he realized, was a fundamental principle. And this is what he had to say. By natural selection, this is Warfield's father, the strongest are made stronger, the weaker go to the wall. The survival of the fittest was a well-chosen and apt term to express this idea. Like Charles Darwin, Warfield encountered natural selection through domestic animal breeding. And this, I believe, is why he could describe himself during his student days as a pure Darwinian. He first met the theory in the feedlot, not in the pew. Now, of course, there were other voices to be heard at Princeton, notably Charles Hodges. In what is Darwinism, recall, Hodge delivered his verdict. In using the expression natural selection, Mr. Darwin intends to exclude design or final causes. And that, Hodge said, was what brought it into direct conflict with the fundamental principles of religion. But on the Princeton campus, there was another powerful voice, the influential James McCosh, president of the College of New Jersey, later Princeton University. McCosh was troubled by the efforts of those who were trying to outlaw evolution. At a meeting of the Evangelical Alliance, he said, it's useless to tell the younger naturalists that there's no truth in this doctrine of development. Religious philosophers might be more profitably employed in showing them the religious aspects of the doctrine. Now, rhetorically speaking, this was a very far cry from Darwinism as atheism, which Hodge was saying. And nowhere, I think, is this more evident than in McCosh's 1887 Better Lectures, the religious aspect of evolution. What galvanized the whole series was, for McCosh, evolution's spiritual potential. For here, he located evolutionary progress in a wider framework of eschatological destiny. As, as, as McCosh peered into a dimly lit future, he found in evolution a clue to the coming age. Here's how I explained it. In all past ages, there have been new powers added. Life seized the mineral mass and formed the plant. Sensation imparted to the plant made the animal. Intelligence has turned the animal into man. Morality has raised the intelligence to love and law. This meant that the work of the spirit is not an anomaly. It is one of a series, the last and the highest. Evolution thus presented Makosh with a rich set of metaphorical concepts from which he constructed an eschatological hermeneutic that could make sense of humankind's spiritual journey from the brutal struggles of, of primordial man to the glories of the coming eschaton. Now, at the most fundamental level, I guess, McCosh was probably as concerned about materialism as Charles Darwin was. But their rhetoric, their polemics, couldn't have been more different. McCosh knew only too well that the craft of careful wordsmithing was critical to the career of a university president. Embarked as he was on the task of modernizing his college through improving the science curriculum, yet without abandoning its conservative heritage, he needed to balance the forces of tradition and progress with a good deal of sensitivity. Hodge occupied a different space. For if McCosh's mission was to escort Princeton College, 
into the brave new world of the research university. Hodge's passion was to preserve old school values, the old school ethos of the seminary, and to keep it firmly tied to its traditional moorings. In the years that followed, the way in which the Princeton theologians dealt with Darwin reflected more and more what their scientific counterparts in the College of New Jersey, the university, were doing at the time. There, the eminent uh, vertebrate paleontologist William Berryman Scott and Henry Fairfield Osborne, who later became director of the American Museum of Natural History, they all strongly adopted an evolutionary conception of nature that bore the stamp of James McCosh's metaphysics. They believed that evolution was directional, and they coupled this firm um, conviction with their certainty that the theory's empirical basis was unassailable. This constituted a rather distinctive Princeton take on the whole subject. What they remained open to was a kind of non-Darwinian form of linear evolution that allowed for a range of transformative mechanisms beyond random variation and adaptation. The theologians, I think, across the campus adopted much that perspective. Let me return with Princeton now very quickly to, to Warfield as, as I conclude this final case study. In 1915, Warfield brought out a lengthy article entitled Calvin's, sorry, I should have had that up earlier, Calvin's Doctrine of the Creation. Here he made much of Calvin's insistence that the term creation should be strictly reserved for the initial creative act and for the creation of the human soul. All other creations, he said, technically speaking, were not creations at all. And I quote him, they were modifications by means of the interaction of nature's intrinsic forces. To Warfield, this opened the door to a naturalistic explanation of nature, including the human physical form through secondary causes. According to, to, to Warfield then, Calvin's doctrine of creation, believe it or not, was a very pure evolutionary scheme. Indeed, he went on to say that if Calvin had read the days of creation as six ages of the growth of the world, Calvin would have been a precursor of the modern evolutionary theorists. Now, of course, it doesn't matter whether he's right or wrong about this. It's the fact that he's saying it. That's what's interesting and important in 1915. So, if my argument has been sustained, in different settings, Presbyterians reacted very differently to the evolutionary proposals that were emanating from the pen of Charles Darwin and his disciples. Despite their shared confessional heritage, the reading of Darwin was modulated by the setting in which they found themselves. That conditioned the rendezvous with evolution. Now, if the narrative I presented approaches accuracy, it's clear that in different places, different meanings were read into and read out of Darwin's theory. In each case, local circumstances had a critical role to play in the manufacturing of Darwinian meaning. Cultural politics, race relations, sectarian rivalry, educational policy, local scientific expertise, public theatre, textual criticism, these all shaped the encounters. What could be said and what could be heard about evolution in different localities were therefore very different. I suspect it's still the same today, but whether or not that suspicion is well-founded, I leave for you to judge. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much for a really interesting talk, really fascinating. I wonder, I just have an informational question. Could you fill in the one piece of the narrative you skipped? What yeah. were the cultural circumstances that contributed to the Russian um, oh, focus yeah. on mutual cooperation rather than uh, 
aggression? Sure. Well, first of all, I'm not a Russian historian, so I don't know a great deal about this. But the conventional, um, the conventional way of understanding this is that um, in, in, uh, these, all these naturalists conducted the research in Siberia. And the Siberian wilderness, it's very unlike where Charles Darwin yeah. did his research in the teeming <laughs> tropics and so on. So there's a natural circumstance, first of all. So um, here you have, um, uh, if anything, the struggle is against the, the weather, <laughs> the environment, rather than against other species. And so they, they thought that from the natural world, they were finding evidences of where cooperation was actually a selective trait. But it also fitted in with their ideas about the commune and also about uh, the way in which people who cooperated together had a better chance of survival in that kind of threatening environment than elsewhere. So once again, they were kind of reading the politics and, the, uh, and nature in some sort of tandem. And of course, with people like Kropotkin, who went on to become an, an anarchist and so on, um, struggle was not part of the ideology that he would be adopting, but um, cosmopolitanism and uh, cooperation and so on were part and parcel of his radical politics. So I think it lies somewhere in there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mustafa Kara Ali, I'm a postdoc uh, fellow here at uh, HDS. I'm interested in, in the dimension that would relate epistemology as a scientific or perhaps a historical approach to understanding scientific progress and also the context of that progress that you, you referred to here. So I want to relate the fact, the historical fact that Charles Darwin himself was influenced by Joseph Priestley, who was a Unitarian, in, in some ways, epistemologist. Let, let us not get into the religious dimension of what that means, sure. um, but let's look at the epistemological dimension of what that means. And, and this is why Locke, for example, would be an important Unitarian in terms of the empirical approach, the unification process to science. Mm -hmm. So... Then the question that, that arises is the relationship between the epistemological relationship between what Charles Darwin was attempting in providing a unifying theory, pretty much similar to what Newton was, another Unitarian, uh, was trying to provide with his unified theory of physics. So then the question of all these commentators within the Presbyterian tradition yeah. are Trinitarians. And there is an implication here epistemologically, uh, and the middle ground between the two is Greek dualism, whereby Unitarianism was an attempt to overcome dualism of the Greeks between the mind and the body, the mind-body problem, by providing a unifying theory between the body and the mind. Mm -hmm. While Trinitarianism in some ways was a way of saying there is a third way beside the Greek dualism because they also wanted to overcome that dualism of the Greeks, but rather their way was to say there is a third way and that's pretty much the heart or the, this sense of transcendental element, right? Mm -hmm. So it would be interesting to shed light on these commentators with respect to Darwin's Unitarian epistemology as opposed to their Trinitarian epistemology. Thanks. Okay, I, I don't know a, a whole lot about this. I'll just say um, a couple of things. One is that um, I really don't think myself that um, Darwin is um, uh, particularly concerned about epistemology. I mean, maybe I'm adopting his own rhetoric too quickly, but he, he describes his mind as one that, that just churns out facts. I mean, he really is very strongly em empirical and, and empiricist. Um, so the connection between Unitarian epistemology and Darwin I just don't know anything about I mean, uh, just that would need to be looked at, and I guess I would need to look at it um, as well. Um, the issue about these being Trinitarians responding to um, the fact that, that Darwin is a Unitarian, I've not read, at least in the people that I've been looking at, they do not raise any of their Trinitarian convictions as having any key role to play, at least in a self-conscious way, in responding to what Darwin's theory is. That doesn't mean to say it isn't there, of course. I just haven't found it on the page uh, the way I, I, I might have expected. 
Darwin doesn't think he's a very good philosopher. I mean, he says this on, on numbers of occasions, and maybe you're going to make a case that, as a matter of fact, he is a good epistemologist, even though he, he perhaps thinks he isn't. That's all I can say, but it's not something I've thought very much about, really. Yeah. Well, Darwin's theory, some would say Wallace's, was kind of a seminal moment in the history of ideas. Yeah. It uh, introduced an entirely new age. Did any of these uh, philosophers realize that they were standing on the cusp of a, a kind of uh, change in, in the way that uh, the world was perceived, that they were already starting to fight a rear guard action and defending ideas that uh, you know, were precious to them, but uh, were probably in the long run doomed in the, the onset of a secular society where they would be marginalized? Yeah, well, I'll say two things in response to that. I mean, I, I do think that they sense real dangers in what's happening. And that's why I think a number of them are referring to um, the cultural and social implications that might arise from, um, from Darwin's theory and, and so on. Um, but I mean, it's not just the religious groups that are, that are feeling this. I mean, if you were to take, depending what you mean by Darwinism, if you were to take um, the modern definition of Darwinism that evolution takes place purely by natural selection and adaptation, you'd scarcely find a Darwinian in the latter part of the 19th century. They're all looking for other non-Darwinian mechanisms, Lamarckian ones, orthogenetic ones, and, 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 and so on. And so it's not just that these guys are thinking that their world is crumbling. Of course, they may think that. But most of the scientists are actually unhappy about what Darwin's saying. And Darwinism goes into eclipse around about 1900 and doesn't get resurrected until the, 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 the neo-Darwinian theory later on in the in the 20th century. But I think that they're also being marginalized for other reasons. Um, and this is an old argument that goes back to historian Frank Miller Turner. This is a point in which two elites, particularly in Britain, I don't know about the United States, are competing for cultural authority. One is the clergy, and the other is a new professional elite called the scientists. And authority is moving away from the where it had hitherto resided in the clergy and moving into the hands of, of, um, of the scientists. I think they perceive that. Um, and and one, of, one of the classic ways um, to do this is when Britain encounters cr critical days, crucial days, I mean, typhoid in the royal household, uh, um, cattle plague and so on. Do, will the society obey the clergy's call to prayer or will they turn to the new experts? Are they going to turn to... Uh, veterinary surgeons or, or medical practice and so on. And I, so I think that they do know they're already being marginalized, even aside from the question of Darwinism. Yeah, there's someone up the front here. Hi, thank you, thank you so much for, for this lecture. Um, actually, I had an observation. Last semester I took a class with um, Professor Raghab, and we actually discussed there are um, numerous physicians or doctors, scientists who also identified with uh, a faith tradition. So yeah. I think this is an interesting. This is an interesting conversation, especially because this is kind of antithetical to a lot of conversations that have happened simultaneously. Yeah. So. Well, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I picked out here particularly those people who were identified as theologians. I mean, you might say that Woodrow is an exception because he is something of a scientific tradition. The others are um, almost all uh, clergy. But of course, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are many, many scientific practitioners in the latter part of the 19th century who belong to these mm -hmm. faith traditions and, and, and are, are making uh, uh, criticisms or support for, for Darwin and indeed developing many other sciences as well. Of course, yes, you're quite right about that. Thank you very much. You got to wait for the microphone. Boy, I love putting a dean in his place. <laughs> now, uh, now I forgot my question. Um, uh, so, once the um, original s setting of a place and all of its cultural and social and political establishes mm -hmm. a dial, a, 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 a kind of pattern for yeah. the future. Um, yeah. Is there any kind of um, so what happens when those patterns change? Yeah. And what happen, um, And is there a kind of underlying um, um, steamroller of scientific ideas that begin to get 
cultural um, uh, currency um, uh, that change the initial reception encounter from a, you know, a, a love or hate or whatever mm -hmm. to a sense of um, there is a real um, change yeah. in, um, uh, in, the, in the foundation of the scientific enterprise, which mm -hmm. is just, so I guess that's a two-part incoherent yeah. question. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question, and um, uh, the question's not long enough for me to be able to think of a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> So if you want to talk on some more, that'd be great. <laughs> um, so so your, your first question is about the sort of circumscribing place here and the sort of work that that um, um, is doing. And um, you'll have noticed that I didn't set out with any definitions, um, what I understand place to be. But I, and I use a lot of slippery terms, setting, uh, venue, uh, location, place, space, and, and so on. Um, and, and I think part of the reason for that is I, I don't want us to think of places as sort of cut and dried or sort of fixed, um, but they're always historicized. You know, they're always, places are always in process, in transformation. And so um, what I've tried to do is, is um, uh, pick them at, you know, at, at sort of snapshots at particular points in time because... Um, a few years later, it'll not be the same place anymore, and so on. So what drives this quite often are events. And these events are located events. You know? So you can't understand, I think, most anything about, about um, 19th century science in Ireland unless you realize that an event took place when the British Association came and um, uh, Tyndall gave that famous speech, a speech that echoed around the world. I think it was um, George Bernard Shaw in one of his plays uh, puts into the mouth of one of his characters Things have never been the same since Tyndall gave that speech in Belfast. So it's a kind of time and place that sets it, to, sets it together. Well then, um, uh, and, and of course, uh, the impacts are never universal. I mean, they could go through the documents and I'm sure find dissident voices here. And so I'm just trying to get the dominant, the dominant story. And then you raise a second thing, which um, uh, um, is, is sort of answered in a way in, in what I've said. What changes the initial encounter? Uh, what brings about triumph for one or the other? And um, um, what I'd be inclined to say is you've got to tell that story as well. Uh, the place may have changed. The personalities may have changed. Um, circumstances may have changed. And it'll always be in dialogue with the tradition that has already um, developed. But I think it lingers if you take the Irish case to the present present day. Um, Anti-Darwinism lingers longer, I think, in an Irish context than it might in an English one, for example. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that some of these have resonances well beyond their time, but also there will be other events that will come to transform or modify what those initial stances were. That's a really messy answer, and it, it's a lengthy answer to say, I, I really don't know. <laughs> So at the start of your lecture, you said that it, it might also inform, you know, current encounters between religion and science in some way. That, that I, 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 I thought this might come. Um, um, so to what extent is that, 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 so has the century intervening changed that somewhat uh, because of the, the places that science uh, uh, are done, laboratories and... And, oh, and okay. the, the, the kind of sense of cultural prestige that science has in great universities like this and mm -hmm. so on. So, and also the speed of communication and the yeah. scientific publishing, publishing industry and so on. So I was just wondering if th these kind of encounters mm -hmm. is itself a moment in time yeah. or, it, or has something really shifted um, in the... Uh, subsequent 100 years, yeah. that these kind of encounters can't happen quite the same way again? Um, yeah. And if so, you know, what would science in its place look like now? Yeah. Um, so. yeah. Uh, well, if I can add a sort of supplement to that too, which I, I think you're also um, maybe sort of hinting at, and what would science and religion look like yeah. in, in exactly the same thing? No, I mean, intuitively, um, one's inclined to think with... Um, you know, modern technology and the speed of communication alike, um, things of this sort obliterate space um, and so on. Um, but I wonder, is that true? 
Uh, I mean, um, uh, some, people, some groups that are um, stunningly good at modern technology, I think, um, are sending out messages that are actually reinforcing an enormous amount of cultural difference. So, so the, the mechanisms might only make those local identities even more firm uh, because the speed of communication means that you can get stuff out very quickly. So I'm not at all uh, sure that that, that that obliterates places. I mean, we may have to think about them in different sorts of ways. And the language is important here. I mean, there are people who do research on, on things like um, internet tribes and internet groups of this sort and so on. Maybe it's a different conception of place, but I don't think it has removed it entirely. And I think it's just a, it would be an interesting empirical project for people to look at how these things, if they do, still matter. Now, I think they still matter in science and religion. Uh, because I think that you know, the responses of um, um, various cultural groups one way, one way or another to a range of, um, um, whether it's GM crops or um, uh, embryo research or, or creationism or whatever, um, I think that they'll not be universally the same. And I think that they're likely to reflect other things that I would argue are to some degree place-based cultures. So that'll be my uh, effort at that one anyway. Please join me in thanking Professor. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. That was a very good time.